Hello everyone, Father Wesley Evans at St. Stephen's Episcopal Church, and um, welcome to another weird Christianity, a little casual live stream answering your questions uh, uh, or topics about Christianity and weird stuff as we get into Halloween. Uh, so um, angels, demons, ghosts, witches, whatever, uh, ask me the question or ask me about a topic and I'll try in a short-ish video to do so. Uh, the, today's question uh, was uh, was how many references to ghosts or, or spirits are there in the Bible? How many references to ghosts or spirits are there in the Bible? And this brings up an excellent opportunity to recommend a couple of books for you, by the way, uh, because to double check a few things, I need to check out this great book on Christian demonology. Um, it is called Powers of Evil by Sidney Page, and it's a good one if you want to read about the Bible and the demonic. And then this is a great one on angels, um, Mark, or uh, sorry, Stephen Knoll. There's also a Mark Knoll, uh, Stephen Knoll, Angels of Light, Powers of Darkness. If you've never read anything about any of this stuff, I recommend buying these two specifically. Um, it, feel free to ask me for the ISBNs, uh, and these read these two, and you've got a pretty good little overview. So, how many references are there to uh, spirits and ghosts in the Bible? Well, in terms of spirits, it really depends on your what you mean by spirit, basically. There's about 500. I did actually do use my nifty Bible software to find that the word spirit does appear in uh, at least one translation uh, 571 times. Okay. Um, now, spirit sometimes gets used not for spirits, but sometimes for like a uh, spirit in general, the way we might mean um, uh, had a, uh, a, a spirit of something in more of a psychological or energy kind of sense. Uh, the word spirit in the Bible sometimes just means life or, or something along those lines, okay? Um, uh, let's see my other little notes here I, I took for 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 this um yeah so sometimes that's that's all it, it often means um uh jesus did use spirit in the gospel of luke when he was raised from the dead he said a spirit does not have flesh and bones like you see i have so sometimes uh and that word there he used was uh, penuma um, for air or breath actually spirit kind of has that idea the old testament word for spirit was ruach which means uh, breath yeah, literally uh breath uh, that kind of idea um and jesus uses a different term uh, penuma uh, there for that uh however saying that there's a couple places in the gospels where there's a word um phantasma where we were the word phantasm from and the disciples use that word a couple of times when they ask if jesus is a ghost and they think he's he's something he's he's an apparition he's not there it turns out jesus is really is there and so it doesn't get necessarily used in a um uh, a specific sense if that makes sense okay a specific sense of that uh in that, in that there's an actual entity there that is called a ghost um not when it uses the word phantasma now Having said that, there does appear to be one place in the Bible where a ghost exists. I need to do another video on ghosts. But the Witch of Endor, when uh, Saul goes to this person to call up Samuel from the grave because he, God isn't speaking to him, and he goes to this diviner in, in Endor. The King James translates it the Witch of Endor, so I just use that phrase, right? Um, and uh, summons up Samuel. And it seems to be a ghost. It doesn't use the word ghost there, though. Um, and so are there different words for ghosts and spirits in the Bible? There are, but um, it's almost, um, it's, you, you almost have to look at what's going on in different places more than the word itself. Because sometimes the word can be used just to mean spirit or life or breath or something like that. And then sometimes you have a place like in, in, in the Book of Kings with the Witch of Endor where there is obviously some Samuel obviously an asterisk. I have to do another video on the Witch of Endor. Uh, there is apparently Samuel, like a ghost who comes up, but it doesn't use the word ghost. Okay. And this brings up an important thing when it comes to the Bible. We want to avoid something called an etymological fallacy. An etymological fallacy in that is essentially um, not, not looking at the how a word is used, okay, but looking into the word itself. So the word spirit sometimes means different things in the Bible, but the important thing is how a word is being used. So anyway, giving on that, well, what are some other words used for spirits of some sort in the Bible? 
Well, one of them is angel. All right. The angel, the Hebrew word is malak, more than one angel is malakim. Uh, the Greek word angelos is where we get the word angel from. And that word means messenger. It just means messenger. There are human messengers that are called angels, but sometimes they appear to be spirits, right? They're God's angels and they're God's messengers and they are, they are spirits, all right? Um, so again, etymological fallacy, you want to avoid that. The word angelos, the word malakim just means messenger, but sometimes it seems to be some kind of spirit, right? Um, now this gets really cool. This comes an interesting thing uh, about words for spirits in the Bible. And that, all right, I'm going to let you all in on something that usually only scholars talk about. And the average people, kind of average Christians, don't always, always, don't always know. And that's the word Elohim. Now, the word Elohim, you might recognize. You might recognize the word for God, which is true. All right, word means God. If you paid attention to some of the other uh, videos, you know that the word im is often a plural. So one cherub, two, three, four, cherubim. It's that, that's just what the word means. Well, what's going on in the word Elohim? Because it has a plural, right? Or is it, does it mean God's plural? Because the word El is the word for God in Hebrew. Well, not always, because sometimes it's, it's, a, it's a magnifier. You know, it's, it's a, a plurality of majesty, right? Like, my, think about the queen saying, we are displeased, right? You know, it's that, that kind of deal. But there's a number of scholars who believe that the word Elohim sometimes refers actually to celestial spirits, all right? Um, uh, this is a really interesting topic that I could probably do another video on. This question is a really fascinating question that's just going to take more than one video, I'm sure. So by the way, again, if you're listening to this and you have any other questions about this, please put them below so I know what to talk about. But the word Elohim. All right, so Dr. Heiser and I listened to him at a conference on the, at the Evangelical Theological Seminary. Uh, I'm sorry, um, no, sorry. Uh, Evangelical Theological Society. He gave a paper on the word Elohim. What does the word Elohim mean? Well, he said, you know, it seems to be, so in ancient Israel, they, they were very practical. They divided the world into where a creature lives. And a fish lives in the sea. So a shark is a fish because it lives in the sea, right? We, we got that, right? Uh, a dolphin would be a fish because it lives in the sea. Now, we would say, well, a dolphin is a mammal. It's not a fish. That seems, that, 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 that we divide animals our way. They divided animals their way, all right? Um, then there were beasts that walked in the land, and then there were creeping things that were birds, and then there were, there were birds, you know, or, or creeping things that were bugs, and then there were birds that flew in the air, right? Um, so in the Old Testament, a bat is a bird, not because they were stupid, not because science is superior now. Um, we classify things differently than they did. For them, it flew in the air. It's a bird, all right? So you had fish, you had creeping, you had beasts and creeping things, you had birds in the air. And Dr. Heiser and a few other scholars argue that the word Elohim means things that exist in the celestial heavens. It's a category of stuff. This is a possibility in Genesis chapter 6, where it says the sons of God, okay, Benai uh, Elohim, saw the daughters of men and saw they were, you know, beautiful and there were Nephilim built in, the, in those days. And I will do another video on the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6. So don't worry, that one's coming. Um, and a few other places as well. And so, for instance, in Isaiah, when God says, um, when God declares, Yahweh says, I, Yahweh, am unique among the Elohim, that God is saying that there's, yeah, there might be this, these creatures, Elohim, but he, he's a different class above. He's not like all those other Elohim, see? So one of the words that might mean spirit in the Bible might be the word Elohim in certain contexts. Now, not in all contexts. Sometimes it, it really just means God and translated that way with a capital G, but not always. It's, it's kind of interesting that way. So uh, I've got a short video, so I don't, I don't want to digress too much, but I can talk more about that later. That is called, um, if you want to look it up online, uh, Dr. Heiser, uh, and it is, um, oh, oh, wow, the name, uh, name slipped me, but he has a whole website 
dedicated to some studies he has, has done on that. And I will talk more about that in another video. A few other words that do appear, such as watchers, the watchers, you may have heard of that, only appears in the book of Daniel, but seems to refer to angels. Um, also princes, so it talks about princes, which is a generic word, um, but we get that as a reference to angels as well. Oh, a few words for demons. So in the Old Testament, Old Testament um, words for demons vary. There are different words. So in the New Testament, we often get the Greek word demonion. Uh, demonion. Now, demonion means lesser spirit in Greek. That was the idea. In, in Greek culture, it didn't necessarily mean in something evil. It just meant something less than the gods. That, that's, that's all it meant. Um, but uh, the New Testament uses it for these kind of evil spirits that Jesus encounters, right? Sometimes he uses words like evil spirit or unclean spirit. And then sometimes it uses this word demonion. Well, there's a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, and it also translated a few Hebrew words as demonion, as, as demon. But those Hebrew words a little bit vary. Um, for instance, one of those words is sedim, and the word sedim, which, uh, depending on your translation, is sometimes translated demon and sometimes translated idol. Because in the way the Old Testament uses that word, it seems to refer to foreign gods, i.e. gods that are not Yahweh. So gods being worshipped by Babylon or Assyria or the Egyptians or whatever. So some translations translate it demon because the, the Greek translation of the, um, of the Old Testament around the time of Jesus used the Greek word daemonion for it, lesser spirit, okay? Which in Christian ideas, right, in the Gospels, daemonion gets used specifically. It really does mean evil spirit in the New Testament, but didn't necessarily mean that in the Old Testament or in, I'm sorry, in Greek culture. And then it translated this other word that often means idol, okay? There's another word in Hebrew, uh, sarim. Uh, I may have mispronounced that. It's been a while since I've taken Hebrew, <laughs> to be fair. Um, and it is also the word for goat, like, like, a, like, the, like the animal, a goat, okay? Um, and it seems to mean hairy one. And it's used a few places, um, Isaiah and then Deuteronomy as well, to seem to mean some kind of um, possibly evil spirit. Now, some scholars think a couple of places in Isaiah, it's debatable, and it might just literally refer to goats who are wandering around. See, sometimes what happens when the prophets condemn something, when there's an evil city, um, uh, what happens is that they say it will become a wasteland, right? God's just going to wipe this city off the map and there's going to be nothing there and it's a wasteland. It'll be such a wasteland that it'll be a place where wild animals live, okay? And Isaiah seems to do that. And so a couple of times it, it, it's unclear whether Isaiah is like it'll become a haunt for ghosts and evil spirits and stuff or he just means it'll become a place where wild goats live and it's crawling with bugs. And it's a, it's a little bit debatable but sometimes it does seem to mean evil spirit so hairy one so so there is a possible biblical connection to the idea of of sort of an imagery if you will and christian imagery of demons being presented as goat-like creatures some translations translate that as satire okay satire satire i say satire we may don't might be different, but because satire is something different, right? So says satires, right? The the Greek mythological creature that's half man and half goat. Um, that's probably not really accurate or fair because it is a Greek idea. Um, so it's probably better translated demon or hairy one or wild evil spirit or something. But interestingly, it's connected to the same word for goat. So that's another Old Testament word for that. Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, uh, Lilith. Lilith appears in Isaiah 34, uh, possibly. It does talk about a night creature, and the Hebrew word is Lilith, which is pretty close to, um, uh, let's look at that. I wrote down the Akkadian word here, because I don't always remember the, the, uh, the Akkadian uh, here. I didn't take Akkadian in the seminary. I wish I had. That would have been kind of fun. I was never as good at languages as I would have liked to have been. Aha! Uh, Lilatu, which was an Akkadian demoness um, that was known to prey on particularly children, and later that entered into certain um, uh, Jewish legends about Lilith. You may have heard the word Lilith before. Uh, kind of seems to be a popular one. Appears in fantasy games and movies and things, um, but it also might appear in Isaiah 34 as something as this plague this city that is destroyed, again, by God's judgment, has become a haunt for 
for all sorts of things. Um, interesting about that, I'll have to do another video on that, but Jesus talks about demons who exist in wastelands as well. Uh, Jesus goes into the desert to be tempted by, by the devil. Jesus in the Gospel of Luke says when a demon goes out from a person, it goes to waterless places, right, and then comes back. So there's, there's, there's an interesting connection between um, the demonic in the Bible and sort of wastelands and waterless places and wilderness kind of, kind of things. Uh, not that the wilderness is evil, you understand, but there's, there's, there's a symbolic connection there. Um, let's see what else we got here. Oh, uh, just a note that spirit and ghost and word history mean the same thing. So spirit, right, uh, is a, a spirit. We, we get the word spirit from the Latin word spiritus, and we get the word ghost from the German word geist, and they basically mean the same thing. I do have a funny story. When I was a kid, I had a hard time with using the phrase Holy Ghost, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, right? And I was really into Ghostbusters. Uh, I shouldn't have used that past tense. I am still into Ghostbusters. Um, and they, according to my mom, I, uh, when the preacher was preaching about the Holy Ghost, I drew a Ghostbuster symbol on a piece of paper and held it up, right? I, I wasn't sure what to do with, um, with a Holy Ghost when I was a kid. But the word ghost and the word spirit mean the same thing, right? So that, that's, that's where they come from. Um, but again, there is a word for ghost possibly in the Greek, phantasma. It doesn't really get used much. It basically means apparition. It's very rare and doesn't appear to, to refer to anything specific. Um, other words for spirits, cherubim, which I've already talked about, it's a type of angel seraphim and Isaiah 6. Um, that's a lot of different words. And this video has already gone on too long. So uh, let me know what questions you have. Hopefully something in here piped your interest a little bit. I can talk about any of these words a little more, any of these concepts a little more, uh, any of these ideas. I can talk about something else. Um, please let me know. So I think I've got a question lined up about the Witch of Endor, and I've got a question, question lined up about the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6. But again, just to finish up, uh, again, for all these words here, if you want more on demonology, Christian demonology, I definitely recommend this one, Powers of Evil by Sidney Page. And he talks about those different words for demons in the Old Testament specifically and the meaning of the word demonion in the New Testament. And then also more about angels and all in general, Angels of Light, Powers of Darkness by Stephen Knoll. Uh, if you've never read anything on angels, demons, or weird stuff, I recommend these two to start. So there you go. Um, so yeah, again, let me know. Hopefully this video was interesting for you. Um, let me know what else I can talk about during Weird Christianity October. And uh, put your comments below. And thank you very much and have a blessed day.